My dear people, I have to tell you that I, I, I don't think I can quite find the words to describe the, the sentiment that is in my heart today as I come to join you for this celebration of Mass in this very holy, very sacred place, this place uh, of great historical significance to all of us. As I was driving from the ferry dock uh, to here to the church, following Father Sebastian, otherwise I'd be lost, <laughs> spinning around the island somewhere, I, I turned, my, my dear mother traveled with me today, and I, I said to the folks in the car, including my mother, I, I said, I, I, as we got closer and closer to the church, I I said, I don't know how to quite express how I feel. I, I, I feel very humbled. And yet at the same time, I feel very proud. I know that sounds like a, a contradiction. I'm proud to be the 11th successor to the great Bishop Frederick Barrett, now venerable Frederick Barrett. I've been humbled and proud to be his successor from the moment I received the telephone call that I was to be the next Bishop of Marquette. I remember very distinctly as I hung up the phone after receiving that telephone call, I, I, I immediately looked up and above my desk there, I have hanging on, still to this day, hanging on the wall there, a portrait of Venerable Frederick Berrigan. And I was immediately struck. And I, I, I said, right out loud in my office, all by myself, oh my gosh, I'm going to be his successor. And after leaving the office, I met, went first to the Cathedral to the Blessed Sacrament Chapel and prayed before our Lord there, asking for his help. But then I immediately went down to the crypt where Bishop Barrigan is buried. And I prayed there at the tomb of my saintly predecessor, asking and begging him for his help, for his intercession. And so I'm very proud to be his successor, but I'm also very humbled by the great example of holiness that he has left me and all of us in his ministry in the Upper Peninsula. We're here to celebrate today, and I join you today in particular, we celebrate the declaration of Venerable Frederick Barriga's heroic virtue. Bishop Barriga's heroic virtue, that life of holiness that goes far beyond the ordinary, has now been officially recognized by the universal church in the person of our Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI. The whole church now, throughout the world, recognizes that this saintly missionary priest and bishop truly exhibited heroic virtue up and say, and don't quote me on this to the Holy See, as if we needed to be told that. <laughs> we know the story. We know the sacrifices he made to minister to God's people, and especially to the native people. Of this very place, that's why I'm so humble. That's why the feeling in my heart today is really beyond description. To stand in a place where Bishop Erega stood and prayed. To be in a church that he had built. To celebrate these sacred mysteries is a feeling that I will take with me forever. And I, I'm not just saying that because it sounds nice to say that. I mean that from the depths of my heart. To be in this place today 
is, is a little bit overwhelming for me. This declaration of Bishop Berenger's heroic virtue is one of the necessary steps to have Venerable Frederick Berega beatified, raised to the honors of the altar, and one day we pray God canonized as a saint of the church. Think about that. We stand in the place where a future saint of the church I mean, we, we know the saints, don't we? We can think of St. Francis of Assisi. We can think of St. Dominic. We can think of St. Ignatius of Loyola. We can think of even to the time of the Apostles, St. Paul and St. Peter. And all the great saints of the history of the Church. And one day we know that Venerable Frederick Berger will be enrolled among their numbers. And we have the privilege today of gathering in a place that connects us to him in a very beautiful way. Venerable Frederick Berge came here to live out exactly what we read about in the scriptures today. To bring words of life first, yes, to the native people of this region, but then later to the Settlers who came and settled all across the Upper Peninsula. We read in our first reading Joshua challenging the people. They have now settled and mingled among the nations. And they have begun to forget the ways of their ancestors. They have begun to forget the ways of their ancestors in the faith. And so Joshua has to remind them. And he says to them, choose. Choose whom you will serve. Will you serve the living God who has delivered you from slavery and has brought you and is bringing you to the land of freedom, of milk and honey? Or are you going to mingle with the gods of the nations? Whom will you serve? Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people say, far be it from us. God forbid that we would abandon the faith of our ancestors. We will serve the Lord as well. This is what Bishop Berga, Father Berga, came to bring. Those words of life. We read in the Gospel. We're coming to the end of the sixth chapter of John's Gospel, the Bread of Life discourse. And the people cannot, many of the people cannot endure what Jesus is teaching about the Eucharist, about what we are about to do right now. As we celebrate the Eucharist, as we make present the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, as we make present his saving sacrifice on the cross for our salvation, this mystery of the Eucharist that Jesus was teaching about, I am the bread of life, come down from heaven, unlike your ancestors who ate manna in the desert and died nonetheless, whoever eats this bread will live forever. My, and he says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in you. But whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my, my flesh is real food, my blood is real drink. And many of them couldn't endure it. Many of them could not accept this teaching of Jesus. And so they walked away from him. This is too much. We cannot accept this. And they, all want, they cease to follow him. And Jesus turns to the apostles. And he says, are you going to leave me too? Do you want to go also? And Peter, God love him, and one of his better moments. <laughs> yeah, a few that weren't so great. And one of his better moments says, Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe that you are the Holy One. God. This is what Father Berenger came to bring. The words of life. You, Lord, have the words of eternal life. To whom shall we go? Where would we turn? But you have come to bring us life. And Bishop Berenger labored. We know how he labored to bring the gospel to the people of this land to teach them, to teach them in their own language, to minister to them, to bring them the sacraments, 
and at times to defend them against those who would abuse them and use them, and manipulate and exploit them. And he tired himself out bringing the gospel. I said to Father Pavel, because I was originally, he had talked me into doing the bike ride thing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I had planned to do it, and you know, I just, you just never followed up with me, Father Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't go looking. <laughs> but as I pulled up, and of course there's Father Paul and his biking outfit, and I, I said, see now, I said, see, if I had done the biking trip, I, I would have arrived here on this day, I would be all hot and sweaty, and he looked at me in the eye and he said, yes, just like Bishop Barrett. <laughs> <laughs> Duly put in place by my classroom. <laughs> That's the kind of zeal this man had. He spent himself. He walked all over this land. He walked hundreds of miles. From here, all the way up the north shore of Minnesota. One of my favorite stories is how Bishop Berga when he was stationed in his mission in Lens, his, his parish in Lens, in the Synods. He walked from there to Duluth and back in February on snowshoes, a round trip of 600 miles, visiting the native camps all along the way, making sure that those who needed baptism had baptism, those who needed marriage, those who needed the anointing of the sick, those who needed First Communion, those who needed to be taught. This is the kind of man that we honor. And now we can publicly venerate because he has been declared venerable, worthy of veneration. St. Paul, in the reading, talks about this spousal imagery between Christ and the Church. That Christ, the bridegroom, is espoused, is, is wedded to his bride, which is the church, his spotless bride. And every priest and every bishop is wedded to his local church, to his people. You know, people often say to us who are priests, you know, well, you know, it's, it's too bad priests don't get married or can't get married. And I would say, no, we're not married in the, in the normal way, but we are espoused. That's why when, when the bishop is ordained, when Bishop Berga was ordained the bishop, the Cathedral of St. Peter and Chains in Cincinnati, and then came back here, he was given a ring, as was I, on the day of my Episcopal ordination as a bishop. And the ring is the symbol of that spousal relationship. When the bishop is given the ring, he is told to keep spotless the bride of Christ. Bishop Berga was espoused, was wedded, if you will, to the people of his diocese, especially his great love for the native people. His heart burned with love for them, so much so that you know the story of his death, the beginnings of that story. He was all the way out in Baltimore, at the Council of Baltimore, when he suffered a stroke in 1866, just about 10 years after having this church built. And he was very sick, and the people had begged him to stay, to get good medical care there in Baltimore, and, and stay. He said, no, I want to go home. I want to go home. I want to die with my people. And he made them take him back. Because he didn't live but two years after that. And the last little bit of money he had in this world went to care for his beloved native children. The last little bit of money he had on his shelf. Yes, a tourhorse came to see him. And a tourist was complaining and talking about you know, his difficulties with the Indian school and, and how he needed money and, and he didn't have the means that he could have to get it done. Father Berger said, go there on the shelf and get my box. 
a tourist went and took the box and opened it up, and there was Bishop Herod's last twenty dollars, the last little bit of money he had in the world, and he gave it to Father Torres. He says, "Here, take this." Father Torres protested. He said, "No, I can't take your last bit of money." And Bishop Herod said, "I have no use for it now. You need it more than I." This is the kind of man that we honor today, who was espoused to this land. You know, the diocese, we call it the Diocese of Marquette, but you all know it, it was first the Diocese of Sault Ste. Marie, and then Sault Ste. Marie Marquette. It was only in the 30s that the name Sault Ste. Marie was dropped. I kind of am sad that, that they dropped that, to be honest. But this place was very special to him, and I feel his presence here with us today. I truly feel his presence with us here today. As we honor him, as we pray with him and for his beatification, let us follow his example. Let us heed his call. Follow Jesus, who has the words of eternal life.